they went to the United States Navy and they said, hey, we found a U-boat 65 miles off New Jersey. And, and, and the Navy said, we didn't sink it. And went to the Germans and the Germans said, we didn't lose it. So they have this U-boat. They know it's a U-boat. You can hear the phone get silent for a minute. And I said to her, it's a bullshit story. <laughs> There's no U-boat in Boston Harbor. The Germans were saying, well, it's not our U-boat, but if it is, you got to keep your hands off it. And they went, well, hold it. It's either your U-boat or it's not. If you think a German U-boat would actually come into Boston Harbor and then be sunk and nobody would know about it, this is a bullshit story. And Paula looks at me and she says, we're doing this, right? Yeah, there you go. It has been so fatigued from 70 years underwater that it split in two and exploded and blew up his garage. They knew when they entered the U-86, and they could see the bones. They knew that this was a ship on which people had died. The whole, in the control room, it's littered with bones. History X membership has its privileges. To access unedited versions of this and many other History X videos, consider becoming a History X member. Here is part three of deep sea detective Richie Kohler's exploration of the German submarine, the U-869. Huh, it's gonna sound crazy, but you mentioned U-boats and all of a sudden the nuts come out of the, I don't know what it is about German submarines, but it just brings out a lot of crazy people. And what I mean by that is you've got people that are uh, convinced that Hitler escaped uh, uh, to South America, that Nazi U-boats were loaded with gold and, and priceless art, and every U-boat is filled with gold, and it's just craziness. And, and, and I think that you guys have a great appreciation for military operations and the understanding of that. And that's not to say that submarines didn't transport gold here or there, but there, there are people that believe every time the submarines found that it was carrying Hitler and gold. Believe it or not, we actually thought that too at the beginning because it's like, hey, submarine that nobody can explain. You've got Nagel going to the papers, and of course that makes big news, but it kind of almost still stays in maybe not the local community, but it, it's not widespread. And until the Nova documentary came out, none of us would have really even known the story or you wouldn't have even really come into the mainstream. Not you at know. all. Shane, what did you know about this story? Were you familiar with this before we had Richie on tonight? I am absolutely coming at it completely virgin. Okay. You weren't familiar with it. Was it the documentary, John, that you had first heard about? No, actually. In middle school, I just went to Barnes & Noble, and I would always go to the World War II section, and one day I picked up Shadow Divers and read it. This would be about 2006, 2007. So I still have my copy on my bookshelf right next to me. I know wow. Connor wasn't familiar with it. He's a lot younger. but I actually have seen the Nova documentary, so I am somewhat familiar with the story. I saw it when it first came out. I want to say that was November of 2000. How long until these guys get involved? So, <laughs> it's a crazy story. While we're working on the U-boat, the brand new internet came out. And I mean, it was like brand new. I had since been divorced from my wife and I was now dating. And a girl I was seeing at the time brought me a story and she said, hey, look, I saw this on the internet. They're going to recover a German U-boat from Boston Harbor. And I'm like... This is a crock of bull. What are you talking about? She says, look, it's a PBS Nova. They're going to make a special out of it. Hi, my name is Kirk Wolfinger, and I am a filmmaker, producer, director for 40 years and over 200 and some hours of film that deal with all topics from U-boats to the Holocaust to astronauts. You name it, I've probably made a film about it. And since 1990, I've done 30 Novas. So I actually cold called WGBH television studio here in Boston and said, hey, I read an article that you guys are supporting uh, Endeavor to salvage a U-boat in Boston Harbor. Nova had asked me to do a film about U-boats. I would do people who do deep diving. I would do people who fly airplanes. I would do the deck of an aircraft carrier. I would do submarines. I've done all the boys and their toys subjects for many years for Nova. And they put me in touch with a woman named Lauren Aguirre. She was a science editor. And I asked the same question. And she says, yes, we are working with, uh, and she mentioned their names. There's some wacko guy who says he has a U-boat. And so I contact this guy. And right from the get-go, I'm thinking. And I said to her, 
It's a bullshit story. <laughs> There's no U-boat in Boston Harbor. And you can hear the phone get silent for a minute. This guy, he's pretty seedy. Oh, yeah, I got a U-boat. It's blah, blah, blah. Listen, Boston Harbor is not even 100 foot deep anywhere. Okay, let's start with that. And if you think a German U-boat would actually come into Boston Harbor and then be sunk or scuttle itself and nobody would know about it except this guy. So I'm like thinking, hmm. So I do a little investigation and I find out, indeed, this guy has been selling U-boats like other guys have sold the Brooklyn Bridge. It's like, yeah, just give me the money. Give me $25,000 and I'll go out and we'll do this. Well, he had done that to Nova and then Nova asked me to vet him. And let's just say your story is true. Do you really think the German government is going to allow someone to pick up a war grave, scrape out the German sailors and make a museum out of it? This is a bullshit story. So I vetted him and I concluded, I don't think so. He goes, well, what makes you an expert? And I said, well, I found one. We're working on one. In the meantime, I get this email. Was it email? It was 1989. Was it email? No. Yeah, it was 94, 95. I get an email from some guy who says, hey, I heard you're looking for a U-boat. I got a U-boat. And I'm like, yeah, okay, another crackpot. He said, no, 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 I'll show you some pictures. So I had to, with my handy fax machine, fax a couple of pages from the Star Ledger newspaper articles. And she called me back and says, can you come into Boston? So he sent me some pictures of artifacts. And I said to Paula, this guy actually sounds like he's got a U-boat. The other guy, I think he's a shyster. Did you at any time meet with Paula Apsel? Absolutely. Paula was the woman. She was the head at, at that time. She's since, I believe, retired. She's a wonderful woman, wonderful person, strong person. So we arranged to meet Paula. Richie's going to drive up from New Jersey. I was going to drive down from Maine to Boston and meet. That night, I called John. I said, John, I need to borrow your dish with the eagle and swastika sticker and uh, a couple of videotapes of the wreck. And he goes, why? I go, well, I'm going to go to Boston. So we go into Paula's office. My name is Paula Absell, and I'm a filmmaker and a journalist. For 35 years, I was senior executive producer of the PBS science series Nova, and I made several Nova episodes myself. Since 1990, I've done 20, 30, 30 Novas. And sometimes she comes to me and says, there's this guy who has this U-boat, or there's this guy who can get us access to an aircraft carrier, or this guy, blah, blah, blah. I want you to do this. In the back corner was a gentleman that I didn't know at the time. I would later find out he was a producer who we would work with, a gentleman named Kirk Wolfinger. So Richie starts to do his thing. And he looks like some mook from New Jersey. Sounds like some mook from New Jersey. Like, you know, I got this you boy, you know, my partner and I, we got this thing. And I'm going like, oh boy, this is not going to go well. And I can tell Paula is kind of like, oh, what did I get into here? She was pointing at me, like trying to pick apart my story to see if I was, you know, one of the crazies that come out when you say you boat. It was up to Richie to make the sale, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I was listening too, going like, do I believe this guy? You know, is the BS meter going off? I had video of a shipwreck. I was telling them the location. I had given them the past three years of work that we had been doing. I told them the names of all of the experts we were working. I had prepared all of this. And then he opens up this little suitcase and he starts to pull stuff out. And he pulls out a saucer and he flips it over. And on the back is the eagle and the swastika, 1942. One thing led to another and I literally shocked. Them. Paul is very Jewish. And the, the thought of Nazis makes her skin crawl. Most of my team is not Jewish. In fact, I, I think I'm the only Jewish person. And it's tough. I'll never forget how mortified she was when I laid the dish on her desk. She literally physically recoiled when he turned it over and showed her the eagle and the swastika. She literally physically went, ooh, like she was looking at a snake. It wasn't just that the Germans wanted to kill the Jews. Killing them is one thing. They wanted to humiliate them and dehumanize them. They make my skin crawl, but oh my God, I want to touch it. And you could see her with her finger. She, she, she wanted to touch it. And yet at the same time, I think as a Jewish woman, mortified, horrified by the physicality of this swastika I had placed on her desk. 
but she had to touch it and she could almost feel the electricity that was jumping from this dish, the negative energy, if you will. And it was palatable in the room. And Paula looks at me and she says, we're doing this, right? Yeah, there you go. That's another thing about when you go in and you deal with TV types, you don't realize that in a way it's kind of like an audition. You don't know you're being auditioned, but they're looking at you. It was an audition because, you know, when, I, when I'm doing a film, the subject, of course, is very important. But who's the protagonist? Who's the person going to look? They're listening to you and they like your animation. They love your energy. And I had all of that. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Richie and John, as I have come to learn over the 25 years we've known each other, they're great characters. Some of them come to us and fall into the app. The others are well-planned. Some of them uh, we have to raise money for because they're very expensive to do. But all of them have elements that are kind of surprises that you don't expect. And he told me years later, he said, you had it right then and there. When she saw that dish and was you, she just felt like, oh, we have to have the store. We have to do it. And they, and they did. They, they worked with us. And the only thing that we really asked of them was to help pay the fuel. Every Nova at that time and most shows have a development deal. So they'll give you not a significant amount of money, but, you know, enough money to pay your bills and pay yourself to spend, you know, a month investigating a story. After the first three years, nobody wanted to go there anymore. I mean, there, there were many trips where it was literally John and I, just John and I on the boat, paying the fuel to get the boat all the way out there. So asking Nova to help come up with the fuel, and we were the ones shooting all the underwater video. If you don't come back with anything because there's just nothing there, it's like, okay, well, we didn't spend all that much money. But once I say to Richie, hey, I got money. I'm going to go do this. Now you're exclusive to me. You can't be shopping this anywhere else. And they came out for one summer. We were no closer to identifying it. And then they were out with us again. And that's when we had gotten a clue on how to solve the mystery. Now, remember... They had done four years of diving without us, but before any movie was getting made. And they said, this summer, we're going to positively identify this thing. We think we know what boat it is, but this year, we're going to put the hook on it. And so we probably went out five, six times. It was interesting. We had never worked with television crews. And many of them had never been on a 60-foot boat for 24 hours, 60 miles offshore. And many of them were just totally seasick. It is 65 miles off New Jersey, and you're in a 60-foot dive boat with about 12 other people, so there's no room to move around until the divers get in the water. And it's the Atlantic Ocean, so more than likely you're in three-foot, four-foot swells. I mean, some of them wanted to be against the gunnel, you know, and sick as a dog. It's usually when you're moored over the wreck, that's when you get sick. The boat's on the anchor line, and it's just swinging around and swinging up and down and up and down. And yet, when it was time to work, they would literally get up out of the scuppers and grab the boom and, and do what they had to do. But it was just interesting to see how hardcore these guys were to, to get the shot. And remember, you're looking through a camera. Adds to the inducement to vomit. Fortunately, Kirk Wolfinger has got a lot of experience on boats, having done a lot of different water programs. So he never had a problem. Once or twice, I was fine. No, two or three times, I was violently ill. I've been on dive boats 50, 60 times. Half the time, I'll be sick as a dog, and half the time, I'm not affected. For me, the second we started to turn around and go back in, which took about six and a half hours, I was fine. You've got them out there. Horse bread out tells you to go back. You've got the wrong sub. Go back and get some more information. The fact that you had a guy's name carved into a knife, it's not good enough because the guy that had carved his name into it actually went down off of Rabat, northwest coast of Africa. So you got to go back to the drawing board and you pull up this. Well, there's a little bit more of a backstory to that. So what you're looking at is a spare parts box. The front half of the submarine is where most of the crew lived and most of the crew worked. So the, the front half of the submarine consisted of the control room, which is that destroyed, damaged area, the epicenter of an explosion. Forward of that would have been the 
petty officers and officers quarters. And then in front of that would have been the forward torpedo room, which most of the enlisted men would live in. And so we had been focusing a lot of our work there. If you went to the back or the after part of the submarine, you would immediately hit the diesel motor room. And then the path going into the electric motor room was blocked by debris. We could never get into the electric motor room. But the electric motor room was just that. It was a room filled with two electric motors for operating the submarine underwater. And so no bunks in there, no crew spaces. It was just a machinery room. So we didn't really want to get in there for any reason. We didn't think that there was any reason to get in there. And then I was thumbing through one of my many books, a book by Hank Keats. It's called U-Boats. And in it is a photograph of a Bakelite or plastic tag that had a U-boat number on it. And it had, I believe it was the U-853. And I'm like, wow, if we found that, that'd be awesome. So I call the author of the book, Hank Keats. And I'm like, Hank, where does this tag come from? I know it's from the U-853, which is a German submarine sunk off Rhode Island. But whose picture is that? Where did this come from? And he says, well, there's this guy, Billy Palmer. I go, I know Billy Palmer. He goes, yeah, Billy Palmer got it. Hang up on Keats. I call up Billy Palmer. I'm like, Billy, where did you get this tag? Because what tag? I'm like, in Hank Keats's book, there's a tag. It says U-853. Where did you find it? He goes, oh, in the electric motor room. There's dozens of them. I'm like, what do you mean there's dozens of them? He goes, well, on all of these boxes of spare parts, there would be the U-boat number and also what was in the box. And so now I'm questioning, I'm like, well, why would they put the U-boat number on a spare parts box? Because when they would return from a cruise and they had used parts, the chief engineer would then send the boxes off to be refilled with bushings, bearings, wire, whatever, fuses, whatever it was that they need. And then being German, that box had a number, number 37, and it had to go back on board the ship in exactly the right location. So all of these boxes were on a master sheet for the chief engineer so that if he needed a fuse, he knew exactly what box, where the box was stored, and that's why they had these tags. And so I'm like, God damn it. I call up Chatterton, and a plan is now hatched. We've got to get into the electric motor room. Well, easier said than done. There was a reason why we had gotten into the electric motor room before, and that's because it was being blocked by the escape trunk that used to sit in between the two engines. And we used a crowbar to pry it out of the way. And we thought, all right, now the, the path is clear. We can now get into the electric motor room. So now we were able to get back another five feet. And then we saw a huge oil tank. What you're looking at is you're looking aft. And there is the port engine and the starboard engine. And in between them, you can see that round cylinder. That was the escape trunk that was wedged right in front. I crowbarred that thing out of the way and it fell in between the two engines, fortunately not on me. And now you can see that there is the daily fuel tank. So basically the way that German submarines operated is every day the engineer would pump fuel from the bunkers into that fuel tank. It would go through a series of filters and then that would gravity feed the two engines on the surface. So that is a fuel tank, a diesel fuel tank that was strapped or bolted to the top of the compartment that has now fallen. And it totally restricted our swim into the electric motor. So that's where John came up with this crazy plan to take off his tanks, to swim over the obstruction and get into the electric motor room and recover a box like the one that I was holding. And that box now had on it a small tag. The way that I found out what it said was John and I were decompressing. And we had sent that box up, floated up in a lift bag like a balloon. Another dive team on the boat. Those guys opened the bag and they looked at it. And this shot that you're looking at is exactly what they saw. 
And so one of our dive team, a gentleman named Will Macbeth, swam down to us while we're decompressing and on a slate, he had written, the you who now has a name, it's U869. And John and I just looked at each other and we shook our hands. It's like, we're done. We did it. I was not there for that. I think 30 years later, it's okay to admit that. They found it. I think they'd gone out with just like three of them. They were like, fuck, we're just going to solve this thing, you know? And it was getting late in the season. And they knew where they needed to get. And they just went. They didn't even tell us. So I get a call. And it's Richie or John. I can't remember which. And he goes, we got the box. We got the tag. We know what it is. And I said, don't touch it. He said, well, it's in my garage right now. He said, but it's in water. It's still in the bag. And we haven't scraped any of the, the, the stuff off. And I said, because he said, I figured you would want to get that. I said, thank you very much. So the next day, a couple of us jumped in a car, ran down there, got on a boat with a bunch of the divers, including John and Richie, and that box still in the net they sent it up in, went 10 miles offshore so that you couldn't see land. <laughs> they got in the water and then they brought it up as if we were on the dive and they got it on the deck and that was real and they scraped it off and that was all real. That was like it U869. So that discovery was honest, but we weren't there when they pulled it off the bottom, but we were there when they actually pulled the, the tag off and went, it's U869. And that tag positively identified the submarine as the U869. There was no backslaps. There was a sense of relief. And of course, Paula was ecstatic because almost on camera, we identified the submarine. And you can see it right there. We just cleaned it with our fingers. That tag also proved that the U-boat was not sunk off North Africa, but that it had come to New York. All of a sudden, the story just fell into place. U-869 and Commander Neuerberg was originally ordered to operate off of New York and New Jersey, but he had taken so much time transiting around the Faroes, avoiding enemy air patrols and offensive hunter-killer groups, that he burned too much fuel in the eyes of the German high command. So they sent a radio message, which was never acknowledged. And it was only after putting things together that we were able to realize that U-869 and Commander Neuerberg missed the radio signal ordering them to go to North Africa. And now we could be 100% proof positive when we would knock on someone's door and not tell them what they knew. They knew that in 1945, their father, their brother, their husband did not come home. What we were able to do was we were able to tell them what had happened to them, where they fell, and that the people that found them treated them with respect. Because we were working with Der Spiegel in Germany and with obviously WGBH here in America, we had an agreement to withhold the information to Germany and allowed Der Spiegel to find as many of the family members as possible. They did not want the family members to hear about it on the news. They wanted them to be notified by Der Spiegel. And then if they were willing, then to be interviewed or meet us, the divers. Obviously, Horst Bredow fell into that too. He had no idea. And so his moment that he says it cannot be, it cannot be, that's a real TV moment, brother. And it was nice because I had made a commitment even if Nova wanted us to do it, I could never sit in the living room of a family member and go, I'm pretty sure I found your brother's boat. It had to be proof positive. You can't just go into someone's home and not be 100% proof positive. You, just, you can't do that. Because what happens when it's wrong? I knew that if we never, ever found those tags, I would never go to anyone's house. You can see that we actually have the box, the tag. We have one of the artifacts, that white piece of aluminum is a schematic 
for the interior ventilation system of the submarine. And in one corner, it said Type 9C, and then it said Deshameg Bremen. And that was another artifact that helped us narrow down the field. It told us that that submarine was built at the Deshameg factory in Bremen, Germany. It narrowed down the field to only U-boats that meet our criteria that had been built by that factory. Who else is in here in the picture with you? I see John Shatterton, and I see you, and I see Horace. Who are the other two guys? Standing directly next to me is Kirk Wolfinger. Uh-huh. And right behind Horace Bredow is Rush DeNoyer, who was the writer and the producer behind telling the story and dealing with Paula and making the story what Paula would call a Nova. Coming up in part four. We had been told that the crew would write their name on their boots, so we start covering boots. I am very much of the school of thought that if you've got a shipwreck where people have died, I don't think there's anything wrong with photographing it, exploring it, but you don't touch stuff and bring it back. Be sure to continue on to part four of this history exploration of Hitler's lost sub, the U-869, with deep-sea detective Richie Kohler.